Hi, everyone. I'm Judy, the YouTube lawyer. Today, our legal live stream show has a special guest, attorney Yvonne Armendariz. So she is an attorney based in Raleigh, North Carolina. She has her own solo law practice as a family attorney, and she's a graduate of the University of Pennsylvania, as well as Indiana University Law School, where she went um, to enter law as a second career. So she's going to tell us more about her career and how she grew her solo law practice. She is also currently the president of the Wake County Bar Association, which is um, a very wonderful honor. And she is also the founder of the Triangle Latino Attorneys Network. So let's welcome attorney Armandaris to the stream. Hi, Yvonne. Hi, Judy. How are you? Oh, fine. Okay. I'm glad everything's okay with our audio and stuff. So, yeah. So we've actually known each other for quite a long time when we were young attorneys and we happened to meet at the courthouse in Raleigh, probably right. for divorce court or something. <laughs> and you, um, you are one of the first attorneys that I think I met when I moved out here, which oh. is fortunate. Yes. Okay. Yeah. So this is so awesome to find out that your kids are doing well and that, you know, you're now president of the Bar Association and everybody knows you and you're established here now. You know, it's been so many years, but, you know, on the other hand, sometimes I still feel like that young attorney that's bumbling around the courthouse. So. Wait, right. Yeah. I think that feeling will never go away. So, which yeah. is good. Good. Yeah. Well, um, somebody asked us a question in the chat box before the live stream began. Um, the person wanted to know what was your first career? Um, because I, I saw on your website, it looked like you had been a legal assistant for some time. Yes. Yes. Um, so let me see. So I guess I'll just give a little bit of background sure. information yeah. about myself. So uh, and, you know, that'll get interwoven, I guess, the uh, mm -hmm. an answer to that to the question. Uh, so I do practice family law. Um, been practicing now, Judy, I think, what, 14 years? I, you know, about 14, 15 years. Um, I am very fortunate to uh, to be able to be in private practice. I have my own firm. Um, I do work uh, very closely with the Latino community. Um, I'm bilingual, bicultural. Um, I'm Mexican-American, so I speak English and Spanish. And... Um, so the, the the vast majority of my clients are Latino, and uh, it wasn't a practice that I thought I was going to have, you know, when I first went to law school, like, oh, yeah, I'm going to become a family law attorney that's going to be dedicated to the Latino community. But that's just kind of how things worked out. And, and um, I'm very fortunate to have really what is a niche uh, market. And, uh, and I love it. I, I really uh, enjoy what I do. Uh, so I'm originally from El Paso, Texas. Um, shout out to anybody out here who's from El Paso. Uh, so El Paso is, um, to me, it's really just one of the most fascinating cities uh, in the U.S. It, uh, it sits on the border of, of Texas, New Mexico, and Mexico. And so growing up there, um, all of us, you know, you're... You grow up obviously fully American, right? Uh, mm -hmm. you, you're raised in Texas, but you also are a very tied into your heritage, uh, to uh, your Mexican heritage, and um, most of us, you know, you, you're just bicultural as it's a binational part of of the U.S. Mm -hmm. um, and so. Um, uh, so, you know, Mexican American. Um, I went off to school at the University of Pennsylvania um, up in Philly. And um, when I graduated, I wasn't exactly sure that I wanted to go straight to law school. And uh, for me, it was either law school or possibly an MBA. Uh, Wharton is such a big name at Penn. And um, I thought, oh, you know, I, I, why not, you know, a, a, an MBA program here? Uh, so, uh, you know, I was just trying to kind of figure out which path to, to go on. Um, and so when I graduated from Penn, mm -hmm. I worked as a paralegal. Okay, so back in the day, we didn't have gap years. You know, I, I don't, mm -hmm. you know, we just, there's no such thing as a gap year. Uh, if you weren't 100% sure, and there were many of my peers, right, at, at Penn that we didn't go straight into law school or into a grad program, 
um, a lot of you know folks we would we worked as paralegals. So uh, I worked as a paralegal at a big law uh, firm. You know, mm-hmm. uh, uh, a big and firm. What city was it in? That that was in Philly. That was oh. in, in downtown Philadelphia. Um, so I worked there, and I will say that uh, to this day, that experience, um, it really, it's really kind of paved the way for me as to how I even practice now. Um, it, it, I was surrounded by excellent attorneys. Um, this was, you know, 90s or uh, mid 90s. Um, and, um, it's, it's interesting having worked at that firm as great of of an experience as it was, it also was a bit soul crushing, right? Because, you know, you were expected, um, I mean, there was no such thing as work-life balance back Mm -hmm. in the late eighties, early nineties. Uh, you were expected to work hard. These were like the wall street kind of days, the heydays. Um, and, um, when I was there, I worked, I was in the corporate department and we had, um, you know, I was just involved in cases that I thought, oh, you know, is this ideologue from the Southwest, you know, wanting to help the little guy? It was it was a little tough, you know, think, you know, figuring out that, OK, if I'm going to be in big law, really, I'm going to be helping out a particular group of, of Americans. Right. Mm-hmm. Because of the well, well, what kind family. of oh, I'm sorry to interrupt, but um, what kind of law or what kind of cases did you help on? Were they all like corporate litigation types of cases? So I did, um, I don't know if you remember the RTC cases. Remember the savings and loan scandals from back in the day? Yeah, sort of. (laughs) I know, right? It's a long time ago. Yeah. Long, long time ago. So we represented um, RTC, the the Resolution Trust, you know, uh, uh, corporation um, and uh, so it was just um, that was an interesting experience. But I, the the cases that I was also involved in uh, did involve uh, like white collar crime. And, mm-hmm. um, you know, uh, it, again, they were fascinating, maybe not the best cases for me as an, uh, an early, you know, 20, 19, 20 year old uh, fresh out of uh, or, or I'm sorry, tw- uh, 22 year old uh, fresh out of um, of undergrad. Um, but um you know, I, I did, I wasn't sure after that experience that I did want to do law school. So second career, um, it, it's more that I was trying to figure out what path to take. Uh, so I worked at that firm for two years, and then I was approached by um, a different company literally right across the street, still in downtown Philly, uh, which is where I wanted to be, great energy, just a great time in my 20s to to live there. Uh, So um, I took a job at uh, an international management consulting company. And this company had just uh, acquired a a Johnson & Johnson account. So uh, basically, we did like all of the HR work for every single Johnson and Johnson company around the world. Mm -hmm. Uh, So um, I was hired because of my skill set, because they needed folks who who spoke English and Spanish, and particularly for the J&J companies um, that had, um, that were, you know, Latin America, or in the US that had large Latino populations. Uh, So with that job, uh, I was able to take some classes for free at Wharton, and um, and uh, so again, it, you know, it's just a fun time. It was a fun time. Pay was good, you know, as a single. Yeah, and you didn't have kids, so no you kids. those long hours. Right. Yeah. yeah. And um, you know, got to travel for a little bit. Uh, that you know, it, it it was a little bit of grunt work with that with that second job, but um, it still was you know it was it was fun. And um, I then uh, met my husband. Uh, Joe at that time was um, an associate professor, no, an assistant professor at Penn. Mm -hmm. And um, we did decide that, you know, we wanted to start a family. And um, then he got a job out at Indiana University at the medical school. Yeah. So, yeah. So that's how we ended up out there. Mm -hmm. And then at that time, so I had my first daughter. And then I thought, okay, I got to get really serious. (laughs) Like, 
which one, what am I going to do? So at that time, I decided that I wanted to do a master's in public affairs. So I thought, let me incorporate public policy with a JD and then kind of feel a little better, right, about uh, some of the areas that I may want to go into uh, in law. And so I started my first year in that master's program. And then I started law school, the law school classes that second year. Uh, by the second year, uh, my daughter was two years and then I had a son. So I started law school when my son was four months. Oh my gosh, that yeah. must have been so tough. It yeah. was tough, it was tough, but I went to the evening program. And so, um, you know, we just, every day was a switch off at the schools, you know, so I was at the law school there. And then I, you know, give my kids to my husband. And, and uh, so I studied, I was able to study during the day as best as I could, right, with two young kids. Uh, and then I took my classes at night. Um, so that's kind of my, I don't know that it's a second job. It's, it's not like I was, you know, I, I think you had somebody who was a, a cop, you yeah. know, previously. Uh, but I will tell you that in the evening division, everyone had a life story like mine everyone. And that program uh, was just as rigorous. You know, the evening programs are no joke. And mm -hmm. um, and in fact, a lot of my peers, because uh, we all keep in touch, they've done phenomenal, phenomenal from evening programs and people with second careers or with, you know, grown children. Um, I remember in my class, we had a doctor who mm -hmm. kind of, you know, who wanted to to go to law school and, and want to incorporate that practice. Uh, so we had a lot of professionals that were wanting to add on uh, a JD. And so in a way, it was a very different group. Uh, but to me, honestly, a more fascinating group, you know, mm -hmm. than just, you know, folks that are just coming straight out uh, from undergrad. And, and that's fine, you know, that I'm not saying that uh, anything about that, but um, it, it was a, a very nice experience to, you know, you felt like you were with the grownups, uh, so to speak. <laughs> yeah, you could talk to each other and really <laughs> right, right. wave like right. commiserate about kids and, and you know, yeah. things like that. Yeah. Well, I was wondering, so if your husband was a professor there, did you get free or discounted tuition? Yeah, that was, uh, I will say that was the, the main draw of, of going to the uh, law school there. Mm -hmm. um because yeah so I, I was able to get that spousal discount and mm -hmm. obviously that came in really handy mm -hmm. um although i law school at that time it was not as expensive back you know i was there uh 2000 i think 2002 to 2006 or yeah because it's a it's a four-year program mm -hmm. uh i don't remember it honestly as it, it just uh, tuition has just exploded everywhere. Uh, but uh, so it wasn't necessarily one of the more expensive law schools, but um, but at any rate, it was nice to get that spousal discount. So yes. Mm -hmm. is, is that a private school or an in-state school? No, it's a state. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, so it's, it's okay. university. Yeah. It, it's uh, it's affiliated with Indiana University. Uh, and it's it's the one at Indianapolis. Yeah. Oh, I see. OK, yeah. well, speaking of law school tuition, um, Michael Walker had this question in the chat box. He wanted to know if you get a full ride at Columbia or Harvard Law, isn't it best to go to Columbia, especially if you plan to go into big law? And this is um, he followed up and said that, you know, Harvard Law would be full price. OK. So I would say full ride at Columbia. I mean, those schools are expensive. Yeah. At you the know, top. Well, you know, Michael, so I think that um, these two schools are, are phenomenal. So that already says a lot about you. And well, his um, he says yeah. it's for his son. <laughs> oh, I'm sorry. This is for, right. Well, it says a lot about your son. I, uh, yes, Harvard is a name, right? Mm -hmm. uh, but uh, so is Columbia. I mean, my God. And um, oh, that's that's great. Yeah. A Yale undergrad. Yeah, he's going to be fine. Trust me. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I will say that um, having gone to Penn, even though I didn't go to, you know, one of the Ivy law schools, um, it, it's it just opens doors. So he if he's at Yale, it, it just, you know, he, he's going to be fine. He's he's going to do great. Um, I think uh, I would say Columbia, honestly. 
Yeah. You know, and if it's a full ride, absolutely. I would say Columbia, but oh, totally. again, yeah. 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 I mean, there's no use paying full tuition at Harvard when Columbia places just as many people absolutely. in big law and they get all the big law firms recruiting there also. Absolutely. So, I mean, this isn't like a big difference, like Harvard versus Fordham Law School, you know, or Harvard versus whatever, Thomas Cooley. You know? Right, right, right. You know? but, but I will say this, though, that, um, you know, a, a lot of folks get caught up with names, right? Um, I think that you have to look at the practice of law as a long-term uh, game, right? Um, there are some folks who do phenomenally well in law school and, um, you know, and, and but there's, you, you're going to have other students in law school that maybe aren't the a law review people and uh, they don't, they're not necessarily at that top you know, 2% who end up doing better than, you know, and, and you've seen them, Judy, you, you know, who I'm talking about. There's, uh, there's just things that they bring to their law career that uh, makes them, that will make them valuable over somebody who went to Columbia or to went to Harvard uh, or, um, you know, had that perfect, you know, was the editor of law review. I think that, um, you just need to know how to leverage your skill sets. You need to leverage what you have that is a value uh, into your practice. And uh, and we see that all the time, all the time. You you have yeah. big name, you know, attorneys with these petty, you know, uh, big uh, a law school uh, um, uh, uh, credits, you know, or whatever. Uh, to them, and um, you'll see somebody from another school that is not a top tier that is doing even better uh, in their law practice. So, yeah. yeah, yeah, okay. And Serena is thinking about going to law school, so she wants to know. I wonder <laughs> what made you not sure about law school after your first paralegal job, and what made you sure afterwards when you did sure. work. Yeah, I think, uh, and thank you for that question, Serena. I think that. Um, I, th I think that for me personally, and this was this is just a very personal thing, um, having gone to, um, I think I had an idea of what I, you know, I, I thought, okay, I'm going to go to this big law firm and, um, you know, uh, help out. You're just an ideologue many times. I'm, I'm first generation. So I didn't, you know, I didn't have, you know, attorney parents and, uh, so I, I was a full ideologue. And uh, when I went into this big law firm, it was it was tough for me. Uh, uh, some of the cases that I that I was on, I, I felt like, oh, no, who am I defending and um, where am I going to invest my time and my future? And so um, that that was a personal decision for me. And, and uh, I, there's many peers and friends that I have that are in big law. And yeah, sometimes they do, you know, represent, as you know, Judy, the the municipalities, or they, you know, or or uh, you know, the 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 you know the well heeled clients or whatever, uh, and they enjoy what they what they do as well. I, I think that was just a very personal thing for me that, uh, and and it, it was perhaps the cases that I was involved in, and I'm glad that I reconsidered. And I'm glad that I went, that I did decide to go to law school and that I found um, my niche, you know, my area that that made sense to me and that I feel really good about. So, yeah, mm -hmm. so that's kind of my path. Mm -hmm. So um, after you graduated, did you work in Indiana for a while before you came to North Carolina? No, actually, Judy. So I worked. Um, let me see. I, I did, you know, a lot of summer um, uh summer jobs, right? You, you have your internships. I, uh, I had a, a summer associate job at, at another big law firm in Indianapolis. And um, I was about to take the bar exam there when RTP came knocking uh, for, my husband was offered a position out here. And RTP is the Research Triangle Park uh, in North Carolina. And it's, it's become a just a huge biotech 
uh, place and, you know, we're, we're having um, Apple come over here to RTP now and, and uh, just the big names, Amazon. So it's just exploding out of control in this region. Uh, but we, RTP brought us out here in, um, in 2006. Mm -hmm. And so, uh, so I worked out there. I did work actually, I'm sorry, I worked as a paralegal. I did work as a paralegal with another large law firm for mm -hmm. one summer. And then I did, I think I worked for like the Indiana commission on Hispanic and Latino affairs. And that was a lot of fun. So I was trying to variate it. You know, I was, I was really trying to figure out like big law, you know, public interest. Uh, so that was just me trying to figure out what made sense for me. Mm -hmm. I see. And then yeah. when you came to North Carolina, um, first you had to take the bar exam, right? Yes. yes. Yeah. How was that experience as a as an older you know, graduate? Um, you know, it was uh, for those of you that are going to go to law school, you have to take that bar exam seriously. It is not a joke. That bar exam is not a joke. I don't care mm -hmm. how well you did in law school. Um, I don't know how you study, Judy, but I remember uh, going to those Barbary classes. Yeah. And then I would study until like midnight and I'd get up early. It, you have to be super disciplined uh, to do well in that exam. And so, yeah, so I mean, I passed it. Um, you know, first time. Uh, I'm glad I didn't have to take it twice, you know, in Indiana <laughs> and then here, thank God. Uh, but no, it's it's not a joke that, mm -hmm. that works. Yeah, you basically have to budget for paying for the Barbary class and then mm -hmm. maybe even the PMBR or whatever That's right. other courses are offered to help you with the multi-state bar exam. Right. And it would ideally be better not to even work for a couple of months after law school if you can afford that Absolutely. You know, so you can focus. Yeah. And you know what? I should say that I, I was very fortunate, right? Because I'm uh, a dual, you know, income family. Um, yeah, I didn't I didn't have to work. So I, I did devote my time. Uh, but yes, you I think that is smart. You're, you're going to need to take a chunk of time. And even for my peers who were working, they they would take about a month off. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Right yeah. before the test, because you you just have to. Yeah, exactly. I mean, were there times during law school or after law school when you felt like maybe you should just take a break because you had two young children at the time, right? You know, um, I, I was very fortunate to have um, a lot of help, right? My, my husband and I, we helped each other a lot. Um, mm -hmm. What I did do, Judy, is that I I was very conscious about things that I was not going to be able to do, like law review. I remember I thought I, I'm not going to be able to do that. It, you know, it is kind of this kind of crown jewel that that everybody mm -hmm. wants to do. Uh, but I just thought at this point I need to budget my time to make sure that I pass and and do well. You know, in in, in law school and and um, I was involved though with um, uh, with the Hispanic. Uh, uh, the Hispanic like Latino Association. I was president twice of that organization. Oh, I know. Congratulations. Yeah. Thank you. Thank, well, there weren't that many of us, but uh, <laughs> yeah. uh, but that those positions were actually very important to me. They they really mm -hmm. were because they were. Um, I was able to meet a lot of other attorneys and folks from other organizations at like the end of court. And some of those, you know, networking places. Um, and uh, so I just had to kind of budget what what activities meant a lot to me personally, and that I felt would be very good for for my future. Mm -hmm. I see. Okay. Yeah. And here's a question from another viewer. Thank you for your question. Did the law firm environment make you feel insecure as if just being a paralegal was too unbearable? The character Rachel in TV show Suits did the same thing, paralegal than lawyer. Uh, you know, back then, hmm, I don't, uh, big law uh, is very, um, I, I don't know what experiences you've, experiences you've had, Judy, but yes, I, I think back in the day was there was very a very clear delineation as to who were the partners, mm -hmm. who were the associates, uh, then you know paralegals, and then staff. So everybody kind of knew their place. Mm -hmm. um, no, I, I don't think 
I don't think that it made me feel insecure. I knew that it was a stepping stone to something else. And so for me, it was more that I wanted the experience and I wanted to soak in um, how law is practiced. Um, so it was more that way. I, I, I wasn't planning on being a career paralegal. And uh, and look, there's some people that that uh, work as paralegals and they do well financially. Mm -hmm. uh, they actually do quite well and they don't have all the stress that, you know, that attorneys do. So, um, no, I, I don't you know, I, I, I didn't go through that necessarily. But yes, I, I can see I can see that happening in certain firms. Mm -hmm. Were there any times when you felt kind of demeaned by the attorneys that you worked for? I don't think so, Judy. Um, you know, again, this was, uh, so I was in a firm that, um, I was in a firm that um, there were a lot of Ivy League attorneys there. You know, it was kind of, there, there were some firms that were getting in trouble because they were like only admitting Ivy Leaguers. And those of us who were paralegals, I came in. I came in as an Ivy League paralegal, and so mm -hmm. I guess because of that, maybe I didn't. I was maybe seen a little differently. Um, I don't know. I, 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 I'm sure there were some people who did feel uh, demeaned by that. Um, mm -hmm. Yes, of course, of course. Yeah, like being told, like, "Hey, you missed. You missed this period here, or you need to like go go pho photocopy this." pile of papers or go I'm count sure. through all the papers. <laughs> but you know what? That happens to associates as well. That yeah. happens to, to, you know, young associates. And um, I think it's more just, you know, standing up for yourself and, and knowing the value that you bring and, you know, not necessarily standing for that. So. Yeah. Good. Okay. And Serena asks, how did you find out and solidify your own niche? Did mm -hmm. you do anything in law school to help you with that? And how did you develop a client base when you started off your own practice? Yeah, these are great questions. Um, so let's see. I think that um, I think that it's important, Serena, to I guess just to 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 think like a business person, right? If you're going to go to law school, law school doesn't they don't teach you how to run a practice. Uh, in fact, when I was there, we didn't even learn, uh, Judy, how to file a civil summons, mm -hmm. right? You learn yeah. everything about common law and you know um, uh, substantive law, but you don't really learn much about how to run a practice. And um, I think that it's important to always have an eye and maybe that's my business kind of sensibility that, you know, where those Wharton classes came in kind of clutch. But um, so when I first came here to North Carolina, I was hired with a firm that needed a Latino or a Spanish speaking attorney uh, to, to help out with, with family law. Mm -hmm. And uh, I worked with that firm just for a year uh, because I realized that I thought, wait a second, I, I could probably do this on my own. And and I started out very small. I was, you know, I was very conscious of not getting into debt. And um, I think that I did a lot of very smart things when I went out as a solo. Um, and so, um, and just, you know, it just became kind of word of mouth that that my clients you know started coming to me and um and then also networking you got to network and you've got to tell people what skills you have and what you bring to the table and um you got to be very involved you know i'm very involved in the bar uh in the wake county bar association and you know the more people know you and they trust you the more they'll refer you clients so Mm -hmm. Yeah. And we're so lucky that in our area, Wake County Bar is very active. We have so many lunch meetings and different committees and, you know, yeah. they have some socials and continuing legal ed. So it's just so important to get to know people in your surrounding community. Um, so it, I think once you start practicing, you definitely want to become more active in whatever your local county bar is. And we also have a very active Wake Women Attorneys group. And um, I used to be active with the Durham Orange County Women Attorneys when I worked in Durham also. Right. Yeah. And, and then, Judy, that's how we met each other, because of all these networking groups. 
Yeah, yeah, or yeah, that definitely like it's it's just more fun and it makes you feel like you're part of the legal community yeah. and you never know when somebody can help you out or refer people to you. And then we also do like, you know, there's all these like different community projects where we do help or or like kind of pro bono types of activities and stuff. Of course, this was before COVID when people were really more out and about. But um, there's just like so many ways to get to know other attorneys, especially if you're a solo attorney. It's so yeah. important that people actually know you and trust you and feel comfortable referring people That's to right. you. That's right. Yeah. yeah, it's you know, it's funny that the smart attorneys always say it's not what you know, it's who you know. Yeah. And, uh, you know, it, your law degree, yes, it, it looks great, you know, hanging up on the wall, you know, but it's it uh, it it's a practice, you know, and it's mm -hmm. in, in, a, in a lot of ways, excuse me, it's a business. And so you've got to develop a relationships with people. Um, people have to know what you do and, you know, what your skill sets are. And um, you got to just, you know, put yourself out there in that way and be very proud of, the, of your skill sets uh, because mm -hmm. people will uh, understand that and they'll uh, take to that. And uh, when they know that you are um, passionate, like, for example, about helping out the Latino community, of course, they're going to want to refer you their Latino clients if they can't help them. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah, exactly. Like, um, for example, I do some employment law cases. Mm -hmm. And so there was a Latino attorney that I got to know through uh, what was then the Academy of Trial Lawyers group. Okay. And it's not like we're personal friends or anything. And I hadn't seen him for many years. But then one day, lo and behold, he started emailing me and saying that he had some potential clients. And, mm -hmm. you know, they don't speak English that well, but they just got sued by one of their former employees. Do you think you can talk to them? them. And so I, I was happy to talk with him first to get more details and stuff. And then the clients ended up having their son come and help translate a little bit. And so um, so that turned out to be a really great case. We, we settled it, but it was just because I happened to meet this one attorney probably like 15 years ago at some networking event at the NCAJ headquarters. Right. And he remembered me and we were both active in some of the, you know, NCAJ Academy of trial lawyers, different little subcommittees. And right. um, yeah, so once again, you you just never know, you know, if, if you meet somebody and you're nice to them, and they, you know, they assume that you're a competent attorney, and you're not going to screw people over, and um, right. you'll take good care of these people that they sort of know and need to refer, then. Right, because um, it's, it's also a reflection of you when you refer a client to someone, right? Mm -hmm. It's, it's, uh, you know, you you want to make sure that you're hooking them up with somebody who's, you know, going to do a great job for them, uh, because that does come back to reflect on you. So, yeah, exactly. Yes. Yeah. Um, well, um, maybe can we talk a little bit more about your family? You mentioned that your parents were immigrants and they were obviously not attorneys. So can you yeah. tell me more about your family? You know, it, it's funny because I... I you know, I say that I'm first generation everything, like everything. I'm, I'm first generation Mexican American. Uh, mm -hmm. So both my parents are uh, from Mexico. And mm -hmm. uh, but it's interesting, Judy, I, I, I found out that my grandmother was my on um, my maternal grandmother was born in California. So mm -hmm. we kind of have like reverse migration on one mm -hmm. side of my family. And, and uh, we have you know, people forget that, you know, and I don't want to get political, but, you know, half the U.S. did belong to Mexico. So there was just back and forth. We have a lot of connections, family connections out in California and in New Mexico. But my parents were both born in Mexico. And mm -hmm. um, so uh, we grew up, you know, my me and my siblings, uh, we were raised in El Paso. Uh, so first generation um, yeah, I mean, I'm first generation Mexican American, first generation educated, really. And, mm -hmm. um, and, um, you know, we've, uh, thank God, I mean, we've, we've all done quite well, um, all my siblings. Uh, and a lot of that is my parents and, and their work ethic. And that comes from that work ethic, I think, is, is very clear, uh, from you know first generation or immigrant communities um you want you know you want to work hard for your families and so that mm -hmm. that definitely is something that you learn from your parents 
Yeah. And what kind of jobs did your parents have? So my uh, father worked at, uh, he's so fortunate, he got a job at Southwest Airlines. Mm -hmm. uh, so he started out, um, yeah, he started out in maintenance. And um, it's funny, he's, my dad's just, he's, he's a fun guy. This, this is my stepfather. Um, mm -hmm. He's just a fun guy. And, and um, he was, he just kind of went up the ranks. He ended up being, I think, a supervisor for one of the divisions there. Um, and it's local, like a local supervisor. Uh, but mm -hmm. um, he worked at, at Southwest Airlines, gets to travel now everywhere for free. Cool. Um, and is it, you know, was very fortunate to have a, a good pension. So mm -hmm. uh, yeah, yeah, and my, and my mother raised us. So mm -hmm. yeah. I see. How many kids were there? Six. Wow, is, really? Yes, <laughs> which is shocking. So yes, yeah, so uh, so my, you know, my mother remarried. So four of us from my mom's uh, first marriage, and then two from my stepdad. Mm -hmm. I see. Well, that that must have been like a big culture shock for you to go to U Penn then in Philadelphia. Like, how how was yeah. that? Uh, it, it was, it was very tough, Judy. It, it, uh, it's funny because I, I'm, you know, I talked to some of my friends who were also there. I think for those of us who were Mexican American, uh, in the IVs at that time, it was, it was very hard. It was, it was very hard. And it wasn't even necessarily the academics. It was just that we felt it's like the, the Ivies didn't know what to do with us. You know, it's mm -hmm. like, we're happy you're here. And and there really wasn't much of a support system, I would say, for, for us. And um, it was it was hard finding our, our own way. And uh, but we did, you know, we just like our parents, we, we worked through whatever we needed to work through. And um, but it was tough. I'm not going to lie. It was that experience. It, it's still, you know, it's tough. Uh, and I mentioned to you uh, before, you know, uh, getting on, on live that my daughter was just accepted to Penn. So in a way, it's so validating. Yeah. It's incredibly validating because it's like, oh, my God, that, that was a tough. Um, it was like a love-hate experience. You know? it, <laughs> yeah. You know, because it's like, wow, you're in a big city. It's it's fun. You're with like just the energy is amazing uh, at that school. But at the same time, I, it was very, you know, you're, you're very cognizant of how different you are and that mm -hmm. uh, these are very affluent schools. Mm -hmm. That's so right. Whoever, yeah. Whoever asked about the, the Columbia, Harvard, it, it's every, anybody, it gets a culture shock because um, many of, of the kids that go to these schools are legacies. Like, forever legacies and and uh, mm -hmm. and they are already very very established um and there's yeah yeah I, I remember when i was there something like 65 percent of the students did not need financial aid mm -hmm. which is shocking yeah yeah. So, yeah yeah so anyways yeah i know so um and and i and i say that and maybe it's a little personal but yeah, I think that uh, for uh, Latino Americans, uh, we still struggle a lot with that. Um, and even the the current generation, right? Uh, there's always these issues of, you know, I'm I'm in this school where very few people look like me. Like at my age, I am still the only Latina uh, on the board of directors for the Wake County Bar. At my age, you know, yeah, and, yeah, and uh, I'm the only Latina on certain boards or the certain, you know, and it's it, in a way, it's it's hard that those it's hard to shake off those feelings, uh, but in a way that makes me, I think, more determined that um, mm -hmm. that I want to feel like I belong. Yeah, to give voice to others. Exactly. Yeah. Because you know what? Like, I remember when I first started practicing in North Carolina before you moved here, like back in 2000, 2001 is when oh, I moved okay. to North Carolina. And yeah. we could never, we could hardly ever find any Spanish speaking attorneys because at yeah. that firm I worked for, we did a lot of criminal defense and traffic cases. Mm -hmm. And it just seemed like there was like one older white man that knew Spanish who was obviously not a native speaker, but a lot of times, you know, people would refer, you know, Spanish speaking clients to that man and okay. maybe a couple of other, you know, white, white male, older attorneys that somehow learned Spanish here and right. there. 
yeah, yeah. But so it really hasn't been until like say the last dozen years, the last 10 years or so that really there is a sizable number or significant number of native Spanish. I, I wouldn't even say significant. There, there's okay. a few more. Okay there's number. Yeah. But no, not, not significant. And, and maybe it is the region, right? It's obviously you're going to have more <clears throat> Latino attorneys in the Southwest or in California, but even still, we don't comprise a large uh, percentage of, of the attorney population. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's, it's really, it's stunning. We're what at 2% maybe. Mm. Okay. That's nationwide. Yeah. yeah, and, and even worse in North Carolina. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Oh God, yes. You know, um, and, and so in a way, yes, it it works. I guess to my advantage, you know, to 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 have that niche. But I'll tell you what, I I like having more. I I like when there's more Latino attorneys here uh, because uh, we're able to negotiate. I think better, Judy, for our clients. Mm -hmm. uh, we understand cultural issues uh, a little more intimately. Uh, it makes negotiations a little bit, just a little simpler somehow. And um, and I welcome having more Latino attorneys here in North Carolina. I think it's a good thing and, yeah. and not, nothing to be skittish about, you know. Yeah, exactly. Okay, Serena wants to know what's your work-life balance like right now? Has a virtual environment changed your hours worked and, and or how the business yeah. is run? Well, I think that um, as a solo, and and uh, I, I think you know, Judy, you might you know uh, relate. You you do get to uh, do your own hours, which is great. Uh, but if you want to have a good practice, you better work hard. Um, you you just have to. Uh, work life balance is important. Um, I I, uh, I think another reason, and, and I didn't share this, another reason that I did decide to go solo is that I wanted also to help with the kids. And, and my kids have done phenomenal. They're, they're doing great. Uh, and so that was also a calculated move on my part. I, I knew that there was a market that would support me. And, um, and so, you know, I, I knew when to have my last meeting or consultation with a client so I can get home and help the kids with, with school or whatever they need needed help with. Um, so again, a, just a very different style of practice that I was able to kind of carve out for myself. And, and I, I understand that not everybody's gonna have this life path that I had, uh, but, um, but it is important. And, and the good thing, Serena, is that more companies now are becoming very aware of work-life balance. And um, certainly virtual practice is, it's changed everything. It's changed, mm -hmm. like, it, it's rare now for me to have clients come into the office for consultations. They all want them online, mm -hmm. which That's is good. shocking. I yeah, like it. it's yeah. amazing. Like, I, I, it's like having a consultation mm -hmm. right now with, you know, uh, mm -hmm. it's that simple. Um, so I think the, and who knows what the practice of law is going to be like 10 years from now. It'll probably be a lot more virtual. Um, mm -hmm. And, um, you know, so, yes. But but the good thing is that I think the profession as a whole is really becoming very mindful of, um, of work-life balance and of, of, of emotional health and mental health for attorneys. Mm -hmm. That's right. And nature lover would like to know, how does one negotiate office space for new practitioners going into solo practice, especially in this world of COVID, where lockdowns are somewhat random and out of the blue? Okay. Yeah. So uh, let me tell you what I did. When I first uh, went solo, I actually read, I remember reading a book on, and it to this day, the best $20 that I spent on a book. Uh, that book was like, it was like a general, like you're going to do this, you're going to do that. You don't want to get into debt. So mm -hmm. what I did is that I subleased an office from an established attorney. So that's, let me tell you, attorneys always have extra space and they need someone there. Um, so um, you, you know, you, you're going to be in a good position to negotiate a cheaper price for for an office because, um, you know, all attorneys want help, I think, with their rent. And um, so definitely look into subleasing as a solo 
because your clients are not going to know any different. They come in and they're going to see, you know, the established office. They're going to see the staff there. Uh, you're going to have access to the boardrooms and the the um, kitchen, yeah. the kitchen. You know, also like you have access to everything. So the way that I did it is that I went with an established attorney. Uh, some folks will go into these office spaces that are a little bit more corporate, uh, but they tend to be a little more expensive, in my opinion, because you're mm -hmm. having to pay for everything, like mm -hmm. copier and coffee. Yeah, <laughs> like it's just it's it's ridiculous. Uh, try to partner up with, and again, this is where networking comes in. Mm -hmm. Go go have coffee with people. Go to these bar events. Figure out who's doing what. Ask around. Does anybody have office space that they need to rent? And negotiate a good price. Mm -hmm. Yeah, great advice. Yeah, I started out sharing office space with two other attorneys That's also. Right. Yeah. And the landlord had a paralegal there too. So even though she didn't really work for me, when people came in, they didn't know that these people don't work for me. So it looked more like a real law firm having exactly. people around. Exactly. And it was safer that way too. Yeah. That's right. Yeah. Okay, so the follow-up question is, are there lawyers who negotiate with landlords or contractors? I don't think so. I mean, maybe if you really wanted to hire somebody, but you should be able to do it yourself, especially since I think now most offices are kind of aching for tenants. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I would say don't you don't have to hire um, someone to negotiate with a landlord. I think um, just, you know, work on those neg negotiation skills. And um, so the way that we're taught in law school is um, you always want to, you know, say, hey, listen, I'm willing to pay this amount. Start it out super, super low, right? Super low. So that a landlord's like, oh, God, no, I, I, I can't do that. But because you started so low, they're not going to be up here, right? Expecting a super high amount of rent. They're going to meet you somewhere kind of down here and then you kind of negotiate it. Uh, that's a good a negotiation skill set is, is always start out a little low and then um, they're going to actually meet you at a lower end um, and then you kind of get somewhere um, in the middle there. Yeah, and definitely shop around too because otherwise you don't really have any negotiating power if you have no other options for office space. Yeah, so but let me tell you, you're you're not going to have an issue with that. There's tons and tons of attorneys that are always needing to rent an office, always. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah, my friend is a physio. Ask another physio if he could sublease. But for some reason, many physios. Oh, well, that's kind of unusual. Maybe they they're more afraid of competition maybe in that kind of industry? Yeah, it could be. It could be. Yeah. Um, you know what? Just look around. Just keep looking around. Um, you know, one door closes, five other ones are going to open. So, mm -hmm. um, and there's, um, I don't know. I, I don't know, Judy Craigslist, maybe just kind of looking. Yeah, I actually, that's how, that's how I found um, one of my, actually two Two of my office spaces, one was a really nice place off Weston Parkway in Cary. The All other right. one was another nice place in Morrisville. And right. they just advertised on Craigslist. And these were financial services guys who just yeah. happened to have an extra office available for rent. And maybe they were hoping to get some clients through me, too. Oh, so I see. It, nice. was very, it was very nice office space. And I paid less than 500 a month for each place. Okay. Um, and the okay. first place that I wound up at in Raleigh, I found it through the Wake County Bar Association flyer where my landlord was a real estate attorney. He had a couple of empty rooms that That's he wanted right. to rent out, make some yeah. extra money. Yeah. So, no, you trust me, you're you're never you're always going to have options if you're looking mm -hmm. to sublease or rent a rent space. Um, yeah. And I think what Judy did was right. Start out in the nice areas. Right. Um mm -hmm. Yeah, I, I know exactly what area you're talking about. Um, start out there and then begin to negotiate there because um, people want to rent space. Yeah, especially now, now when everybody's working from home anyway, because that's that was right. that's yeah. one of my selling points. When I rented out my last couple of offices, I, I let the landlords know that, look, I'm not going to be here that much. I'm not going to bring, bring in tons of foot traffic or riffraff, you know, just to assuage them, to let them know that there's not going to be like 50 people storming into the mm. office, making noise and causing a ruckus or anything. Every day. So you were able to negotiate a, a, a lower price for that? Um, 
I'm not really sure. Well, I mean, there was one place that I was at where the guy started offering me lower rent because he desperately wanted me to come back and rent space from him because he couldn't rent out my office after I left. But okay. I told him, I'm sorry, you know, this office is just way too far away from where I live. Oh, and okay. it was really hard for clients to find the place because it was kind of on this little side street off Six Forks. So right. yeah, but you never know. But as Yvonne said, pretty much you're definitely going to find attorneys in your city that have space available now. And um, there's nothing wrong with even asking to have sort of like a virtual office set up if you really mm -hmm. can't afford it, you know, yeah. just to ask the attorney, can I use your conference room for whatever, you know, a few hours every month to just to meet clients and how much would that be? And then you still have an office address. So you look right. legitimate. Yeah, no, absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. Um, here's another question. Okay. What factors do lawyers consider when selecting an expert in a field to help his or her case? Oh, well. What factors do lawyers consider when selecting an expert in a field to help with it? Um, well, I think um, reputation. I, I think, mm -hmm. Judy, you recently had to hire an expert. Oh, yeah. Yeah, yes. definitely. It was reputation, word of mouth, asking other attorneys, like, who do you yeah. think would be good for this topic? Yeah. 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 So, um, yeah, no, no. In the practice of law, you know, many times you have to bring experts, whether it's, um, you know, especially in family law, mm -hmm. uh, you're going to need to bring in, you know, medical, um, or uh, psychiatric or psych yes. psychologists in That's custody right. cases, Therapist, um, and, um, financial experts, financial experts, valuation experts. Um, so I, would, I would say, I would say word of mouth more than anything mm -hmm. and just doing a little bit of research and figuring out, okay, who's hiring who, you know, who's, who's a reputable attorney and who are they hiring? Because honestly, that's how I hire people. Like if I need an expert or, or somebody to do some sort of valuation, um, it's going to be, you know, just kind of putting it out on, on our little group um uh our Listserv. facebook or whatever listservs yeah. yeah yeah okay serena asks what general advice do you have for those considering law school and what tips would you give to those from humble families like your younger self if accepted <laughs> into an elite law school to do well Ooh, these are okay so what general general advice do you have for those considering law school um and what tips so i would say uh because i do get a lot believe it or not a lot of uh younger uh, kids, you know, and I say kids, high school students who who sometimes um, will ask, you know, like, I don't know if I want to do law school. I think you need to shadow some attorneys. I think that it's very important to ask like, hey, um, and again, this is Way County Bar, you know, I, I can't tell you how impressed I am when I get a call uh, from high school. I've gotten calls from high school students who have said, hey, you know, is it okay if I, uh, you know, work for you for just a month or, you know, and it's, I'm just so touched by that. And the majority of time of the times I'm like, hey, listen, come on over. Let me take you out for coffee. I'll take kids to the courthouse, introduce them to judges. Little things like that mean so much. Um, and you're going to learn a lot about the practice of law just by hanging out with attorneys and, um, you know, seeing their day to day and and um, asking attorneys out for coffee or for lunch. Attorneys love to talk to like younger, you know, uh, students and uh, college students. Um, but I would say, yeah, definitely um, try to um, to network again and, and and call the bar associations and ask for mentors. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because if you're in New York City, there definitely is a chapter of the Asian Pacific American Bar Association, New York chapter, and there right. could be other ethnic bar associations out yeah. there. You just look for their website and contact the officers and see who's willing to talk with you or maybe meet That's you for right. coffee. Absolutely. You yeah, no, you have a lot of people, you know, there's a lot of attorneys that are nearing retirement age, and they really want to help out, you know, the, <laughs> the younger generation, they have more time. Uh, and so it's just, I guess, the, the most important thing that I can say during this, you know, live stream is uh, you've got to network, you, you really do, you've, you've got to put yourself out there, and you've got to uh, meet people. And, um, 
you know, you've got to provide something of value to them as well, right? Um, and be grateful for, for whatever time they give you. Uh, but you learn a lot from just observing and, and seeing what it is that attorneys do on a day to day. Um, it's not going to, um, trust me, it's not going to be anything as glamorous as what you see on TV. Uh, but, but there are some days that are that, you know, when you're at the courthouse and you feel like, wow, this is, this is great. You know, I, I, I did well for my clients or, um, I helped with a very dicey, you know, custody emergency issue. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay. And any advice to your younger self to people who what tips come will you from, give to us from humble? Okay, from humble, if except into elite schools, um, I would say um, you need to find good mentors. Okay. Um, one of the things it's funny, uh, my kids who are now second generation, the schools are just so. Um, cognizant of, of, you know, of kids, students of color, of, of really wanting to make sure that they don't fall through the cracks, right? And, and um, they have more mentorship programs. Uh, my generation, we didn't really have that. I, I don't think there was even a, a, I don't think there was a Latino um, uh, professor at Penn mm -hmm. when I was there. Like, think about that. They, they, it, like, you could count, I remember you can count in one hand the number of of Latino students that, that were there back in my generation. And that was really tough. Uh, so I would say that if, you know, if you're into going into some of these schools and I don't care whether it's a lead or not, just any school, uh, find out about mentorship programs, call the school, talk to the deans and just say, Hey, listen, this is my background. Uh, who start connecting me to people. They will do that. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because that's right. You yeah. need the support system, trust me. And, and mm -hmm. not only that, but you need the examples of people that you need to see, wow, they're doing it. They're, they're, they're doing a great job. And, and maybe I can too, you know, mm -hmm. uh, and, uh, but that's, that's going to come from, um, from getting connected uh, through mentorship programs. Mm -hmm. That's right. Yeah. And it seems like pretty much every law school now does have different kinds of organizations like the Asian American Law Students Group, the Women Lawyers Group, the yeah. you know Gay Lesbian Student Support Group, the whatever IP Patent Lawyers Group. So they all have those types of like mentorship programs where they, you know, just assign you to an upperclassman or yeah. upper class woman, um, you know, who is supposed to just kind of be a casual friend slash mentor and help you out, you know, follow you along during law school. Mm -hmm. So there, there definitely are programs like that offered at pretty much every law school now. That's right. Yeah. yeah. Now this is a kind of um, very specific question. I don't know if you know the answer to it. How do you get started doing chart reviews for, uh, usually they go with, um, people that they already know, like someone with a nursing background or MD, because I, I think a lot of the bigger medical malpractice firms, they already have doctors mm -hmm. that are either on their staff or that they contract with to review potential yeah. cases. So yeah. I think it's pretty hard to break in. But you know, I guess there's nothing wrong with contacting law firms directly to see if you have any expertise they could use. Yeah, absolutely. Uh, you know, it's funny, I get a lot of um, I get a lot of, of mail from uh, from chiropractors, from uh, a lot of medical professionals saying, hey, listen, we, we're here, we can help out. Um, and that's very smart, very savvy, you know, mm -hmm. yeah. Yeah, that's um, kind of out of our expertise though, because Yvonne and I do a lot more family law and just general civil litigation, but I, I'm pretty sure the med mal firms already are hooked up with certain professionals that they use to help them prepare cases. Yeah, mm -hmm. from your experience of a building owner, a mall owner wanted a 10 year lease for office space that you can get back to them. And uh, uh, I don't know, I mean, that's kind of like a commercial real estate question. So it really depends on how desperate they are for a mm -hmm. tenant or not. Yeah, yeah, but three months sounds like really short for commercial. It does, office. yeah, I, I, I think, think so. um, I, I would say, uh, if you're needing something small like that, there are so many places that will allow you to um, to rent month to month. In fact, the last building that I was at, Judy, it was month to month. I was there for nine years. Oh, but it was nice. month, yeah, it was month to month. So mm -hmm. just look around. There, there's, I mean, real estate options are 
just everywhere. You're, you're going to find buildings that are for small business owners. Um, mm -hmm. There's some people that literally just need um, an office space that looks, you know, a little bit more professional, but mm -hmm. uh, for, for small businesses or web businesses, uh, you're going to find tons of buildings that offer month to month leases. Mm -hmm. That's right. And um, one of my frequent guests is Jonathan Michaud, who is a solo attorney in Boston, who used to be okay. a law partner at a bigger firm. And so he has a really nice setup where he and a handful of other attorneys all use the same office suite. Mm. But I, I kind of feel like in practically every mid-sized or larger city, there is there are going to be these office suite type setups where yeah. a lot of attorneys are all using the same general gigantic office suite and you share the same conference room. Yeah. So there's probably some sort of setup like that, um, depending yeah. on what city you go to, to practice. Absolutely. Yeah. yeah. No, I think uh, if you really are wanting to go solo, uh, there's, there's going to be tons of, of options for you uh, with that. I, I don't think that I'd want to go with like a big mall or anything like that. Yeah. Yeah. You don't want to come right out with a like $2,500 a month rent. No, <laughs> That's no, no, overhead. No, 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 yeah. no, no. And I will tell you, there's a lot of attorneys who do that. There's a lot yeah. of attorneys oh, yeah. who go into very expensive leases. Please do yes. not do that. There's no need yeah. for that. No exactly. Need. Yeah. There was a family law attorney who told me that's how much her rent is. I'm like, why? You don't need it. I mean, you're yeah. a solo, you know, right. I mean, do you really want to have that stress of having to bill so many hours just to break even with yeah. your rent first right. and overhead? Yeah. yeah. Now, again, it depends on the market, right? It, yeah. It's, you know, two, three thousand might seem a lot in certain areas and it might be cheap. Yeah. Right. In, in, New York, in New York. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much, Yvonne. I know it's just a little over an hour, so we'll go ahead and um, end our live stream this week. I, I really appreciate you guys showing up and asking such great questions and Yvonne, you know, giving time out of her very busy schedule to share her background and expertise also with us. So thank you, Yvonne. Thank you for having me and congratulations on your show, Judy. This oh, is sure. Would you like to tell us about your business website in case anybody has any cases <laughs> to refer to you? Sure. Well, I am, uh, it's Armandara's uh, Law, Armandara's Law Office. And um, so let's see, I'm on, um, I'm on Instagram and on Instagram, I believe it's Armandara's PLLC. Oh, okay. Yeah. But if, if okay. you type in Armandara's Law, <clears throat> I think it's armandaraslaw.com. Yeah, you're, okay. you'll, you'll find my, my website and uh, it is for English and Spanish. And Yeah. Uh, do, you, do you restrict your practice to Wake County or do you go to other counties? No, I'm pretty much like greater triangle. Triangle meaning uh, Raleigh, Durham, Chapel Hill. Mm -hmm. uh, I, I, you know, being Latino, Judy, you get calls from every corner of North Carolina. So no, there's times where I'll go to Robeson County or wow. yeah, no, yeah. Mecklenburg, uh, William, you know, just everywhere. Uh, but I, I would say my main practice is here, Wink. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. Well, thank you so much, Yvonne. If you can just stay on for another minute and we'll just go ahead and say goodbye to our viewers out there. Thank you guys for being here and we'll see you at the next live stream. Bye, thank you. Thank you.